Welcome back, everyone. Good to have you with us. You've tuned into NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast, and I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima Magin. On this episode, as requested by many of you, we're going to dive right into an actual deal breakdown. Describe the factors we evaluate when deciding whether to greenlight the deal or not, and run the numbers. That'll hopefully give you all some deeper insight into the types of property profiles, the costs, the returns that you can get here in Japan, and also shed some light on what we believe to be the right criteria to evaluate these deals by. So for our first case study, we're going to look at a Kawasaki City residential studio unit. Kawasaki, to those among you who aren't too familiar with Japan, is a medium-sized city located to the immediate southwest of central Tokyo, just 15-20 minutes by train from Shibuya or Shinjuku, which are two of Tokyo's most popular business and shopping districts. Very popular Japanese location for both families and companies, and as a result, a very popular location for investment purposes as well. Population, just under 1.5 million people, with a steady growth of about three quarters of a percent per year. Quite white collar, with the economy based mainly on heavy industries, electronics and high-tech development firms. Yields are higher than in Tokyo itself, where they're getting severely compressed, but that's been changing over the last few years, and it is now getting harder and harder to get good deals in Kawasaki, which is one of the main reasons we pounce on anything that looks good in that area. So the property in question, as mentioned, the studio unit uh, with a detached kitchen, or what's called here a 1K, one room plus kitchen. Teeny tiny space, just under 17 square meters. But don't let that put you off, as both younger and older low-income Japanese singles are very comfortable with this size. And this is our main target market in a country where people aren't having too many babies or getting married as a rule, if you'll recall from some of the previous episodes. Also, properties that are under 200 square meters also enjoy a property tax discount, so even better from the investor's perspective. This unit was priced at 5.2 million Japanese yen, which at the time of purchase worked out to be approximately 47,000 US dollars. Very attractive price for this location, and since net pre-tax returns worked out to be just slightly below 10% annually, it was a real bargain, at least on paper. Now, just so we're on the same page, when we refer to net pre-tax, we mean the adjusted returns including all known purchase and running costs, meaning the real estate agency's fee, purchase tax, legal and registration fees, uh, monthly building fees, uh, property management fees, the landlord's insurance, and our fees as the buyer's agent and portfolio manager. What's not included in net pre-tax is only the annual taxes, which means income or corporate tax, depending on the ownership structure, as well as property tax, which isn't known in advance in most cases. And also net pre-tax doesn't include any unknowns, of course. So potential maintenance, repairs, vacancy expenses, similar stuff, which is difficult to quantify in advance. So net pre-tax just under 10%, listed price about 5.2 million yen, living space approximately 17 square meters. The main advantage of this particular property, based on our analysis, aside from the obvious exceptional return, are as follows. Firstly, the detached kitchen, which is a rarity for units of this size and is an attractive feature for any future potential tenant. Not only that, but the unit also has a laundry machine area set up with drainage, connecting pipes installed, again, quite rare for a unit of this size, and saves tenants from the hassle of having to go to a laundromat which is also a very attractive feature for them. Particularly for single females who hate going out to do their laundry, they'd avoid this type of unit if they can. Next, the building itself. Very well maintained, quite small, 20 units in all. Major renovations such as rewaterproofing of the roof, repainting and repairing the entire exterior of the building. All of these were done within the last six years, which quite quite minimizes the risk of any sudden unexpected expenses which may cause building fees to go up in the near future or may cause the building management company to hit owners with a one-time payment. Also, the building was built in 1991, which means it's up to the latest earthquake-resistant building standards, which were introduced in Japan for reinforced concrete blocks such as this one in 1981. Combined with the excellent renovation and repair history, definitely a win-win profile. How about disadvantages? 
Well, some obvious disadvantages here are, as mentioned, the fact that the unit is quite small. When tenants are mainly singles, turnover can also be higher, particularly if you've got exceptionally young or exceptionally old tenants. The young ones could get married, promoted, uh, might have to move in with their parents to take care of them when they get too old. And exceptionally old tenants could obviously be hospitalized or pass away. Families do tend to stay longer on average, but even singles in Japan stay for about four and a half years, so still better than in many other countries. Another disadvantage is the building accumulated funds pool, or what's known as the sink fund reserve pool in other countries. These are the funds collected from all owners of individual units over the years, which are then used for renovations and repairs of the building itself as they become necessary. In this property's case, the funds pool quite low on funds compared with the numbers of units in the building. Last disadvantage is the building is located 15 minute walk away from the nearest train station. Not a huge disaster, but out of the 10 minutes comfort zone, which most tenants would prefer in Japan. Now, what we do after reviewing all of this information is trying to weigh the pros and cons against each other to see if the deal makes sense. So here's our reasoning in this particular case. First of all, the fact that the property provides such high returns is a major plus, not only because it's more profitable, but also, and mainly, because it provides us with more of a buffer as far as future maintenance, repair, or renovations are required, either on the building or inside the unit itself. It's rare in, to see a property in Kawasaki yielding more than 6 or 7% net pre-tax, which means that we've got plenty of room to drop to in case a few more costs pile up in the future. And also gives us a very large sales margin. There's always going to be someone interested in a property profile like this, as long as it's still yielding reasonable returns. So high initial return also improves our options as far as exit strategies are concerned. The building look, the location, the profile, all excellent. The unit's feature is very good as well, so we're more than comfortable on being able to quickly secure future tenants, even if we have to slightly lower the rent to be competitive with units that might be closer to the station, still okay. The fact that the unit is tiny, again, isn't really an issue for central city Japanese condos, especially this close to Tokyo, and the proximity to Tokyo also gives us access to another tenant base, people that need to commute to Tokyo itself every day and prefer to live slightly outside the city where it's a bit cheaper and more quiet. So Kawasaki City is a, a large and prominent city as of itself, but it's also considered a bedroom community to Tokyo. So again, expanded tenant base. Now, as far as the low funds reserve pool is concerned, the building's renovation and repair history, as we mentioned, does successfully mitigate most of that risk. The funds here do seem to be well managed and there's quite a small risk of any sudden expenses hitting us at any point in the near future. Lastly, the fact that the building is relatively small, like we said only 20 units of this size or similar, makes it far easier for developers to potentially buy the land in the future, pay off individual unit owners either in cash or by giving them a unit in whatever new building they plan to be building there, which is much harder for developers to do in case of a bigger building obviously compensating 20 unit owners as opposed to say 100 unit owners from their perspective a relative walk in the park so again with this potential in mind we've greatly improved our exit strategy options so really the very existence of a kawasaki investment property yielding this much percentage wise is already pretty rare so to be honest we were leaning towards green lighting this deal from the start we would have needed a serious red flag for us to pass on it. And since none of the due diligence that we've just listed was really concerning or posed any serious risk, it was a pretty easy decision to make. And our clients, in this case, a young professional couple from Australia, were pretty happy with it. They've purchased it about two years ago and to this day have had absolutely no issues with it. Same tenants still in place, no maintenance, repair requests, rent paid on time. So this turned out to be a truly hands-off experience for them and for us as the portfolio managers. Now, obviously we were lucky with this one. Tenants can and do move out. Out-of-pocket expenses do happen. There are even payment issues in Japan, although far less than in other countries as a rule. 
But the point here really is that if you follow the due diligence framework that we've outlined in all of these episodes so far, as well as other materials that we publish, and try to stick to it, like we've done in this case, plus, of course, use your own common sense and experience, any potential risk, expense, or unexpected event can be mitigated properly with losses minimized. And if you're planning out a larger portfolio, diversifying and hedging it with different types of investments is also one of the best risk mitigation techniques you can adopt. But we'll talk about that um, diversity and hedging more in future episodes. We're going to post some pictures of the unit itself and some of the numbers that we've discussed in the show notes. You can also see them in the YouTube channel recording of this uh, episode. So have a look. We hope you enjoyed this deal analysis. We're going to have more of them in the future. And until next time, happy investing.